my name is Nicholas Parsons, and I've loved Edward Lear since I was a child. Nowadays, I do a whole show devoted to him and his wonderful, distinctive nonsense verse. Have you ever heard of someone called Edward Lear? He wrote all these nonsense poems and stories about 150 years ago. Nonsense songs, stories, botany, and alphabets is the volume of poetry that first introduced us to the delightfully illustrated Owl and the Pussycat. Lear is at the beginning of that movement in children's literature which is towards pleasure, which is towards colour, towards bigger illustrations. The Owl and the Pussycat is one of the most famous poems in the English language. And in 2014, it was voted the nation's number one favourite. The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. He always has been highly regarded as a poet's poet, admired by T.S. Eliot or Gilbert Jordan. He touches poetry and culture and comedy in lots and lots of places. I want to explore what lies behind the nation's favourite poem and the collection in which it appeared. They are quite moving in many ways and emotionally engaging in very obvious and immediate ways. And that's the thing I find, find most appealing. The owl looked up to the stars above and he sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy. Oh, pussy, my love. What a beautiful pussy you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Above all, I want to understand the restless, complicated character that gave us these poems. And there's no better place to start than here in this beautiful, tattered old book. of Edward Lear's famous nonsense song stories, botany and alphabets. Fatty facia stupenda. I feel rather privileged to be holding this because to me this is something very, very special. Nonsense Songs was first published in 1871, an unusually eclectic collection of poetry, stories, recipes and drawings. Oh, we've got the nonsense of botany here. The book even contains a set of illustrated alphabets. A was once an apple pie, pity pity witty pity pity, nice and sidey apple pie. <laughs> Nonsense, as a genre, celebrates the whimsical and nonsensical, using songs and poetry full of invented words and impossible characters, and stories to parody the rules of literature and life. The owl and the pussycat. <laughs> And the drawing that's at the top of it is gorgeous. No poem better illustrates the principles of nonsense than the owl and the pussycat. A poem celebrating the impossible love between two animals who are natural enemies. Pussy said to the owl, You elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married. Too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood, a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose with a ring at the end of his nose. We have a poem there that is about marriage. It's become a popular poem to be read at weddings. But it's also a sort of a poem about escape. It's full of impossibilia. You know, it, this is an owl and a pussycat, two species that are somehow incompatible, but who fall in love. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And then hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, they danced by the light of the moon. In 2012, the celebrated children's author, Julia Donaldson, wrote a sequel to The Owl and the Pussycat, 
walking in Lear's poetic footsteps to recreate the ingredients of the original poem. She discovered that the key to success was to imitate the poem's hypnotic rhythmic structure, one that Lear, in turn, imitated from the verse of the romantic poets of the day. I had such fun doing it. You know, I reread all the poems and I loved the meter of the island and the pussycat, so I stuck to that meter. Oh, yes. It's the same sort of sad loveliness that you get in some, you know, slow movements of classical yes. music. And there is certainly a sort of melancholy lilt. That's mm. what I actually love about Lear. If you're going to take on the challenge of extending someone, other writer's poem, a poem which is actually a classic, how do you get into the mind of that in order to be faithful to the original? Yeah, it is the nonsense language, it's the alliteration, assonance, the sound of the words, the nonsense words, and the places, um, the, the sense of a quest, I think, because so many Lear poems are about a, journey, a rather mad, crazy journey, mm -hmm. and the people, the landlubbers, are That's saying, true, yeah. don't don't go, you're mad, you know. So shall I just read a bit from yes, where they sail away? Okay. The, the owl and the pussycat sailed away in a beautiful blue balloon. They took some jam and a honey roast ham, which they ate with their runcible spoon. They sought the ring from autumn till spring, till they came to the chankly boar, and there stood the crow with his head hanging low, shedding tears on the silvery shore, the shore, the shore, shedding tears on the silvery shore. Alas and alack, said that bird so black, tis I who have caused your woes. I fear I have sold your ring of gold to the popple who has no toes. <laughs> so the, the popple has the ring, but of course they feel sorry for him because he's got no toes. Oh, I know. He's fallen in love with the ring, um, mm. so they have to find something to swap for the ring mm. so they can get the ring back but so... Julie, that's, that's so <laughs> clever. I mean, it's not only beautiful and, and Lear-like, but to, to, to take on the, the style and mantle, it's pure Lear, <laughs> and you've done it. It's wonderful. And right? I did manage to have a happy romantic ending to mine as well. Uh, yes. so, and, and in fact, he wrote, he wrote his own sequel to The Island of the Pussycat. He started writing mm -hmm. one, which was really sad. The, the pussycat falls out of a tree and the owl goes demented with grief and their children are half owl and half pussycat, which sounds a bit gruesome. <laughs> so my sequel comes before that all mm. happened. Our mother died long years ago. She was a lovely cat. Her tail was five feet long and grey with stripes, but what of that? Our owly father long was ill from sorrow and surprise, but with the feathers of his tail, he wiped his weeping eyes. There's a fine line in all of Lear's poetry between joy and melancholy, perhaps because his own childhood was marked with sadness and difficulty. In 1817, when Lear was only five years of age, his father was thrown into a debtor's prison. Two of his sisters died of shock, and to save money, his mother gave him away. But worst of all, he had epilepsy. And at that time, epilepsy was considered a, something which was a, akin to madness. And people didn't talk about it, in case you were put away. So you can see, often ill and lonely, rejected by his mother, Lear escaped into his own fantasy world. Like many survivors of childhood trauma, the adult Edward Lear found his childhood hard to leave behind. Writing nonsense was the perfect way to stay playful and childish. While he was able to enter into the mind of a child, I always think he also identified with the child within the adult and brought that aspect of them out. One of the keys to nonsense is that the absurdity that it exposes is the fact that we grow old but we don't grow up, that we, we are still children. I suppose it's the key insight in a way of Freudian psychoanalysis which also comes out of the 19th century. It's, it's the notion that actually we are still children. Is that why I love him so much? Because there's a child within me that I can't escape from. I well, just I, th I think it. our creative selves are child mm -hmm. selves. Mm -hmm. By the time he was 15, Edward was living with his unmarried sister Anne and was looking for work. 
he found an outlet for his talents in the newly opened London Zoo. But it wasn't as a poet that he would earn a living. It was as an artist, drawing exotic birds here in the aviary. It was here he developed not only his skills as an artist, but his lifelong passion for nature. It can be no coincidence that his later poetry contains very few human characters. H was a heron who stood in a stream. The length of his neck and his legs was extreme. H, long-legged heron. <laughs> His drawings were a huge success. He published a book of them when he was only 19, which brought him instant recognition. Before he was a poet, Edward Lear was in fact an illustrator, and his first illustrated book was a book of parrots, uh, with absolutely remarkably accurate drawings of parrots. This was produced as a very expensive work with 42 plates produced in colour lithography. Um, and David Attenborough, for example, considers them to be one of the most accurate uh, depictions of birds in the early 19th century. Uh, so a P for Polly has perhaps a particular resonance, I think, for Edward Lear. P was a Polly, all red, blue and green, the most beautiful Polly that ever was seen. P, poor little Polly. It would be another 40 years before Lear published Nonsense Songs, but while he was still enjoying his first creative success as an artist, he was introduced to Edward Stanley, the 13th Earl of Derby. Stanley had a menagerie of his own at his country seat at Knowsley near Liverpool, and Lear was invited to come and draw the animals. It was a huge honour, but one he accepted with mixed feelings. So you can imagine this young lad from the background he had and the emotional troubles which has beset him, arriving that long drive, walking all the way down here, and then coming up here, and having to go up to that door and meet the footman. Poor man. This is amazing because you know from reading about it that this is where it all happened. The 13th Earl, who was a very entertaining, gregarious character, would have lots of people here. But think of young Edward Lear, 19, 20 years of age. It must have been quite difficult for him to enter here and sit at the table with all these well-connected people. But he was such a natural person. He gave out spontaneously to people. He was in no time at all. He was accepted and admired and loved. Lear moved in some of the very highest circles of Victorian England. And there's a sense in which he's aware of himself as a sort of court fool, a court jester, um, who is, is, is welcomed to that kind of a table because he's known to be entertaining and to be funny. And he's aware, as the best court fools are, of the sort of uh, the inbuilt ridiculousness and also potential melancholy of that situation, being kind of in a lonely situation. Lear's poetry is filled with a sense of an outsider looking in, with the best views of society's foibles. In Spicky Sparrow, Lear satirises the pretensions of the social climber. The sparrows think that if they buy new clothes, it will give them an entree into the upper classes. Then, when so completely dressed, back they flew and reached their nest. Their children cried, Oh, Ma and Pa, how truly beautiful you are, said they. We trust that cold or pain we shall never feel again. While perched on tree or house or steeple, we now shall look like other people. So that sense of, you know, um, if only we're like other people, we'll be happy. But of course, it's, it's completely precarious, even as he's saying it, perched on tree or house or steeple. Um, it's like Chekhov's gun, isn't it? You know, if you're perched on a steeple, you're going to fall off it. Whilst the aristocracy of Knowsley may have moulded him into a budding satirist, 
this great house offered inspiration in another way. It was here he first tried his hand at poetry, but not for the adults. Oh, so this is the nursery. It's now apparently a music room, but this is where it all began, where Edward Lear first started writing his nonsense to entertain lots of children, because more than one family would be living in these stately homes at that time. Just imagine the atmosphere. He'd walk in, he'd be greeted by lots of excited voices, shouting out from the poems they knew and asking for other ones, looking at his drawings. It's, um, it's, it's quite nostalgic, it's quite almost eerie for me to be here because having loved Lear for years, to think that in this very room, something that I've got to know about so well and love so much, it all began here. The mid-19th century, as well as being a time of huge industrial and scientific progress, was a time of astonishing literary invention. Apparently from nowhere, there was an explosion of literary nonsense. Not just Lear's poetry, but also Lewis Carroll's novel, Alice in Wonderland, appearing within a few short years of each other. Do you think there's any coincidence that this cult of nonsense which appeared around at the same time both Alice in Wonderland and Edward Lear. Do you think that there was something about that period, that time, that produced this wealth of humorous, nonsensical verse? One aspect, I suppose, is that the 19th century is an era of systematization. Mm -hmm. So it's an era where there is a lot of taxonomy of plants and animals which Lear spoofs in his nonsense botany. It's the era of the railways, of the creation of the police, of the creation mm. of a universal education system. So in a way you could see nonsense as a kind of reaction against that curriculum. Perhaps the biggest influence on Lear as he began to write his nonsense verse at Nursley were the animals he was spending his days drawing that lived in the Earl of Derby's menagerie. These were exotic creatures that most people in England would never have seen before. My theory is a lot of the names he came up with are directly related to the animals that were here. The animals in particular, not so much the birds. Um, but a lot of the animals came to Knowsley without scientific names. They hadn't even been described. So they had their original names from the indigenous people who lived in those countries. There's the Whiskered Yark, the Coquitoon. My particular favourite is the Jingy Jonga. And then you've got all the kangaroos with strange Aboriginal names, like the Woolly, um, the Narbalek, and the Quokka. So where did Edward Lear get his names from? He got it from being round here, and then the keeper saying things like, oh, the Quagga's got out again, or, you know, oh, the Jingy Jonga just trod on my foot, or something like that and it's bound to have had an effect on him. Said the duck to the kangaroo, Good gracious, how you hop over the fields and the water too, as if you never would stop. My life is a bore in this nasty pond, and I long to go out in the world beyond. I wish I could hop like you, said the duck to the kangaroo. Whilst Lear's nonsense is firmly linked to the Victorian age of discovery, he didn't invent the genre entirely. The real roots of English nonsense go far deeper. There's that tradition, I think, of nonsense nursery rhymes, nonsense songs, refrains in songs of the Hey Nonny Nonny variety. And also a tradition, I think, of sort of uh, topsy-turvydom, and fooling, which goes back through the fools of the Elizabethan stage and goes back into the kinds of carnivals of fools of the Middle Ages and back ultimately into the old comedy of people like Aristophanes. Lear takes nonsense in a new direction. He, he perhaps builds on some mm -hmm. of the ideas that are present mm -hmm. in earlier nonsense. Mm -hmm. But his nonsense is full of lyricism, of pathos, of characters, and it's hugely exuberant, both verbally and visually. And I, I think it, it has much more depth mm. than non much nonsense writing before it. As well as giving nonsense his own emotional depth, Lear would bring to his poetry a pioneering visual style. In 1846, he published his first book, 
a collection of limericks called A Book of Nonsense. Fantastical rhymes without reason, he called it. He used expensive lithographic printing, as he'd done with his earlier Book of Parrots. Lear's case is unique, I think, uh, for the 1846 uh, edition, the first edition of A Book of Nonsense, because he is both the author of the verse and the creator of the illustrations. So, and this is not the case with a lot of children's books, where the author would write the text and perhaps the illustrations would be provided afterwards. They would be done by a commercial illustrator, for example, and put in, not necessarily with the full approval of the author. For its first edition, Lear wrote under the pseudonym of Derry Down Derry, the name of an Elizabethan fool. There was an old Derry Down Derry who loved to see little folks merry, so he made them a book and with laughter they shook at the fun of that Derry Down Derry. One of the things that contemporary reviewers remarked was that it was partly the illustrations that children so loved because so many 19th century books um, were not illustrated. That's Often right, they, were, they were really quite small. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, so you know, this is an example of a, a book from the 1820s, mm. the English reading book in verse, uh, 1822. And it's really quite tiny, which mm. of course in a sense is suited to small fingers um, mm. of children. But at the same time, it's not very rewarding the type is very small and we have um, you know poems which are called things like meekness mm -hmm. you know many of them are, are quite evangelical in, in telling children how they should feel whereas if you look at um, this is a later edition of, of Lear's book of nonsense mm -hmm. um, you have this wonderful acreage of space, mm, this yeah. tremendous exuberance of line, mm. um, where here we have the woman who is supposedly baking her husband by mistake in a stove, but we can tell from her expression that it is actually far from accidental. I'm interested in that relationship Lear creates between image and text. The centre part is split the thing. So I've come to visit Ralph Steadman, a modern-day master of cartoons and caricature. And this, this is your studio. studio. This is where it all happens. Oh, and the piggy wig ya. Pyramidalis is lovely. Ralph has an interesting take on Lear and believes that the illustrations are so crucial to his work that he must have drawn them before he wrote the poetry. I'm certainly experimented with his curiosity first, mm -hmm. visually. Did a drawing. Did a drawing, mm -hmm. and then Put a thought, to what it. is that? You know, mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's, it's a, a pigeon. It's a jumbly, yes. Wittgenstein said, um, the friendly German philosopher, wasn't it? Mm. The only thing of value is the thing you cannot say, but if you can see it, wow, you see it immediately. That is a really interesting mm. thing to think about. Ralph thinks his anarchic creative process is similar to Lear's, letting his feelings and thoughts flow from when the first ink blot hits the page. Ah! Oh, look at that. I can see a face already there, a mouth. He thinks the only way to persuade me is to take me out of my comfort zone, a man of words, and get my hands dirty. This is an old-fashioned pen. Yes. Don't you want to do anything? I, 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 I don't know how to. I'd love to. Go I'd on, you're to... going to have a go now. So, what do you want me to do? Just draw something? Draw something is part of that drawing. I mean, you've got well, to. Well, add to it. Add to it, yes. This is how Lear would have, would have worked, actually. Yes, he would have done. And he probably What start... he saw from yeah. starting to, do, draw, to start draw to do something it, down. Yeah. Our combined effort has produced a drawing that is definitely saying something, though I'm not sure what. Oh, that's a tongue, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yes. P is for Parstead, a funny birdie word. Half Parsons, half Steadman. A nonsensical bird. P is for Parstead. This is a genuine Parstead. It's a bastard. It's a bastard, bastard. It's past being a bastard. It's a bastard, Parstead. Yes. So which came first, the Parstead or the egg? the drawing or the poetry. We may never know, but what we can be sure of is how completely integral Lear's drawings are to his verse. The, the pictures and the poems are hand in glove in, in Lear, they always are. And he thought of his works as picture poems. So if you go to Edward Lear's diary and you go to the day, 
on which he composed the Owl and the Pussycat, the entry says, um, went to visit the Simmons with a picture poem for little Janet. And he wrote the Owl and the Pussycat for Janet Simmons, uh, the daughter of the writer John Altington Simmons. But what interests me is that, that when he records writing the Owl and the Pussycat, he describes it as a picture poem, hyphenated, you know, they, they, they go together. I mean, I, I think there is a sort of element to that where he's kind of capturing the Victorian engagement with the visual imagination. He's kind of combining all the senses. So both the sound of the poems and the visual layout and the illustrations. Um, I guess in a sense, he's the first sort of multimedia poet in that way. And that's the uh, sort of most enduring aspect of his legacy. Lear was living in self-imposed exile as a painter in Italy when Nonsense Songs was published. He always dismissed his writing which he called Bosch, but the critics thought otherwise. Some of the, the responses were are quite interesting from a modern point of view. So, for example, one of the critics in The Spectator noticed that it's the female cat who proposes to the male owl in the true spirit of yes. women's rights, says the reviewer. And um, so there's something, you know, which is actually quite unconventional about these uh, mm -hmm. poems that, you know, nowadays we're, they're so familiar, particularly mm -hmm. the owl and the pussycat. But there's a, there's a spirit of liberty about them, which I think is part of what we love and, and what, what contemporaries responded to as well. Nonsense songs, stories, botany and alphabets is now out of print. But Lear's most popular poems have lasted in anthologies ever since, as has his pioneering nonsensical spirit, which has been admired and reincarnated in the work of many other writers to this day. You can find Lear influencing poets like T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, and also people like Spike Milligan, Monty Python. So I think he touches poetry and culture and comedy in lots and lots of places. In 1886, Edward Lear wrote his last ever nonsense poem, Incidents in the Life of My Uncle Ali. He could have been writing his own epitaph. It so clearly sums up the essence of his life, his love of nature and travel, but his deep feelings of being an outsider and of never fitting in. On a little heap of barley died my aged Uncle Ali, and they buried him one night, close beside the leafy thicket. There his hat and railway ticket, there his ever faithful cricket. But his shoes were far too tight. Well, if you've enjoyed this program about Edward Lear, and his nonsense songs and stories and verse and so forth, and also enjoy the other books in this series, then go to bbc.co.uk forward slash the secret life of books and follow the link to the Open University. <laughs>